please make sure that your mics are turned on and that you speak clearly into your microphone just so everybody can hear us. Uh, we've got some feedback that some of our uh, meetings are not being heard well on YouTube. Um, 114 of 140 of our seniors this year, roughly 81% of the class, will be receiving notification that they are most likely to be eligible for automatic admission into Central Connecticut State University, Southern Connecticut University, Western Connecticut University, Eastern Connecticut State University, Mitchell College, University of Bridgeport, University of New Haven, and University of St. Joseph's. This means that they will be able to fill out a short application form for no charge for uh, automatic admission into those universities, which is pretty impressive and exciting. The first class that has this uh, coming your way. So I bet you're going to be getting one of those letters very soon. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and that's it for, oh, and I want to thank Betty Osga, uh, Dr. Betty Osga, who sent me a lovely thank you note for participating in her, uh, uh, her professional development series for aspiring uh, superintendents. So that was lovely to receive. That's it. Thank you, Mr. Agnello. Ms. Baker. A couple things. Wanted to piggyback on Superintendent Butler's um, congratulations of our women's sports teams and to just give a shout out to our women's field hockey team that 
no matter what happens on Saturday, you will return to Stonington winners, regardless of what the final score looks like. I think the performance in, I believe, sleet and snow conditions <laughs> certainly solidified that status, but wanted to give them a shout out and say, you've made us really proud. Also want to go ahead and thank my fellow board member, Dan Kelly, for attending CABE over the next couple of days. Thank you for doing the conference circuit. And to Superintendent Butler and her colleagues at EastCon, presentation on Saturday, correct? Correct. So thank you to our two members for representing us at CABE this weekend. Mr. Kelly? You're welcome, Sarah. Um, Outside of what Mrs. Butler said about all the athletic accomplishments, uh, I will be at the per, uh, play on Saturday night. There's a special little uh, person in that play, a.k.a. my nephew, um, who's performing, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, and I won't be able to go to the soccer game, but I heard there's no uh, snow scheduled. On, I'm not sure if we have a full slate of volunteers for the um, concession stand duty on Thursday we could always use more help at the concession stand as the Bears football team takes the field and beats up on the Bulldogs on Thursday morning Thanksgiving which we'll be hosting we're expecting a big crowd up here at the high school um, and then one of the th uh, meetings I attended uh, was a welcome and school committee at Dean's Mill and it was good to uh, sit down with them yesterday and work with some of the parents and some of the teachers and staff there on working on some things for uh, Dean's Mill as well as the district. That's it. Thank you. Heidi? No, that's fine. <laughs> Mr. Donahue? Yeah, uh, so tonight I had the pleasure of uh, joining um, Principal Daw and the High School Welcome Schools Committee, and uh, they're just very dedicated parents. It was good to see the engagement with the schools and everything like that, and I look forward to working with them in the future. Thank you. Do you, do you have anything? Yeah. Turn it on. Uh, I just wanted to thank Ms. Da, um, Mrs. Butler and Mr. Smith for coming in and talking to the student government members about the recent events about the pride flag issue. So um, all the student government members really appreciated like the clarity on that. You're welcome. Thank you. And I ask uh, comments from citizens regarding items on the agenda. Good evening. So I'm hoping that um, some of this will be discussed as we get an update on um, the progress of the resolution that the board had passed. Um, I was made aware that there might have been a recent professional development for the faculty where they were instructed um, on how to handle this and um, how to handle other things in schools. And I was just wondering if parents could get an update on what was provided to them um, and how to handle this situation. Um, I know that some teachers decided to take this resolution and um, I know a student came home because the teacher had a pride flag originally, now they put two pride flags in the room. And I'm just wondering where we're going to be going with policies and how this stuff's going to be handled. Um, I thought that that was, you know, a shove into some people's faces if they were uncomfortable with the flag in the classroom and it had no regard for st all students' opinions, just particular ones. Um, so I'm just wondering where we stand with some of that. I'm hoping that some of this will be addressed and that um, I would just like to know where the administration is in dealing with these types of things and the instruction that's been provided to our faculty. Um, and I just think that the political position provided by some board members recently in their handling of this and um, how they pre presented themselves is just a little concerning given the fact that, you know, representative of an entire community and here to protect an entire student body regardless of their political affiliations and I just think that I would ask that people take a note into that because 
there are some students who feel certain ways and might feel disregarded by some comments that were made. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Yes. Go ahead, please. Yes, please. Try that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> this is my first time. Um, I just wanted to thank the board. I, I did attend the last meeting. I thought it was really productive. And um, I wanted to thank you all for the resolution that you passed. Um, uh, I just wanted to say and uh, reaffirm uh, my gratitude that the resolution was passed and clarified. Um, I heard the students loud and clear. And I heard the teachers loud and clear. Um, uh, they spoke of the pride flag in particular um, in their own experiences as very much an inclusive um, item in the classroom and they were very um, and they felt very safe because of it so I heard the students and the teachers who spoke loudly and clearly so thank you for uh, for protecting the right to, to have the pride flag in the classroom and that's it um, I'll leave the microphone on in case uh, anybody <laughs> else has to mess with the mute button thank you Jason Next item on our agenda is the benchmark assessment score by Mr. Smith. Good evening, Mr. Chairman and the board. Uh, it is my pleasure to also uh, welcome uh, high school principal Alicia Daw in this presentation with me just to uh, have the opportunity tonight to share some big picture wide angle lens data and information with you in support of board goal number one, which is Stonington Public Schools will continue to improve academic performance, growth and experiences in math and ELA. little technical help for all of us, right? <laughs> My clicker won't click. My, uh... Okay, okay. So the first thing that we're gonna look at, uh, again, at a very, with a very wide angle lens, are some of our fall benchmark assessment data uh, a total for grades three through eight. We have a program that we use called STAR 360, uh, which gives students uh, a small benchmark assessment. Uh, it's uh, 20 to 30 questions, usually takes under a half an hour to take. Um, and the data scientists are able to correlate uh, this snapshot uh, into a scale score that then uh, is used to predict their ultimate performance on the state uh, Smarter Balanced Assessment, which happens in May. Uh, it places students based on this benchmark as a predicted in the four levels of the SBA um, performance as either uh, below standard, approaching standard, at standard, and above. And the metric that we always use uh, with the state testing is we combine the students who score at the level three and four, and we call that at and above, because those are the two levels. Um, so if we can move to the next. 
So the total for grades three through eight uh, with this fall benchmark assessment is that it predicts that 54% uh, percent of all of those students will score in those top two bands of the Smarter Balance. It gives you some uh, comparatives uh, in the, the, compared to the spring of 2022, uh, it predicted that 52.9% would score in this band. Our actual, a few months later in May in 2022, was 65%. Um, one of the things that we found historically over time is that the predictive correlation for math is a little, has a little more deviation than the predictive ability for the ELA. Um, but it's usually our results here in the benchmark assessment usually underrepresents where we score in the actual assessment in May. Um, so it's bottom line here is we're pretty much right on where we expect to be in math. And then in our reading scores, which are generally a little bit higher, as in most districts, the benchmark yielded a, a predictive score of about 69% of our students in grades three through eight uh, scoring in those two bands. And again, the same comparison, our spring benchmark uh, in the past school year in spring of 22 uh, was at 74.4%, and then the actual score on the test in May was a little lower, 73.6. Uh, our spring score uh, on this benchmark assessment in 2021 was 69.9. So again, for a fall benchmark, this puts us right where uh, we should be. And next, just uh, a total grade by grade uh, from three to eight. One of the things that, the numbers that we're watching very closely is our eighth grade score. Uh, this is the highest uh, benchmark, fall benchmark that we've had in eighth grade uh, in a long time. It's leading the middle school because we typically have a mismatch in eighth grade. In the past, we have some students in eighth grade uh, who are in a geometry class and some kids who are in the eighth grade math class, which is a pre-algebra class. And so uh, when they take this state test in May, the geometry kids are being tested on a curriculum that they skipped over to get to geometry. Uh, and so the scores are always uh, uh, kind of a mixed message. Last year, our eighth grade SBA score was uh, only in the 40s. Uh, so this is a very good sign because this year what we did programmatically is uh, as part of our pandemic recovery, every eighth grader is taking the full year of pre-algebra in eighth grade math. And those students who excel in math were given the option of taking geometry as an elective class, as an additional class, uh, every other day for the school, full school year. So those students will have the best of both worlds. They'll have a full year of the pre-algebra before they go into Algebra One as a freshman in high school. And they'll still have, uh, our top students will still have the opportunity to take the geometry unit in middle school, which will allow them for those top math students to get all the way to calculus without having to take two math courses in a single high school year. Uh, so we're very, we're very hopeful based on this number that that programmatic change will have a good result uh, in math for our eighth grade students. And then the next slide is the same, uh, break down grade by grade in reading. And now I'm going to ask Alicia to come up and talk about the high school since we don't really have a universal benchmark assessment like we do in grades three through eight to talk about the high school. So as Tim said, uh, one of the reasons we utilize uh, we compare D's and F's is because the last time I stood in front of you, I compared mm -hmm. our SATs and PSAT data from the previous year. So this is a nice, and of course that's only with certain grade levels. So this is a nice um, slice to, uh, to give you to see how our students are doing actually throughout the entire year. So go ahead. So taking a look, 
this was the number of D's and F's our students um, acquired in the spring of 2022, quarter four. So the total number of D's and F's in math uh, last year at the end of the quarter was 83, and for ELA, for English, was 52. Next. So comparing that to this fall, uh, the quarter just ended, uh, the number of uh, D's and F's for math was 69, and for English, ELA was 49. So we dropped significantly, which is uh, great news, because usually you don't see such a, um, an increase in achievement at the beginning of the year, because at the end of the year, um, you expect those numbers to be lower. So uh, again, so looking at that, Steve, just keep the screen right there. Don't touch. Um, math last spring was 83 D's and F's, and this year um, right now is 69, and last spring we had 52, and currently we have 49. Um, one of the strategies I would attribute that to is we started RTI at the high school. So myself, uh, Mr. McDonald, and Mrs. Crowley, our Director of Guidance, um, we run a bi-monthly, every two weeks, an RTI meeting with um, our guidance counselors and special ed teachers and we take on a caseload of students and we monitor their academics, um, social, emotional um, achievements throughout the school and we put in strategies and goals and we meet on those goals with the students um, and prime and actually as the year goes on we would invite some of the students to these meetings and we report on their progress so that's one of our uh, new strategies we're employing this year um, at the high school next attendance It'll lift. Okay, so we're going to spend uh, another couple of minutes talking about some different factors of attendance. It, for the state of Connecticut, they really look at two different metrics on attendance. They look at average daily attendance and chronic absenteeism. So we're going to talk about average daily attendance first, and that's pretty straightforward. Every day, you have X number of kids in school, X number of kids who are absent for any reason, and that's a percentage of the total population of your school, and that running average is your average daily attendance. Go ahead, Steve. So, you know, not to be, you know, not to disappoint the board, uh, in September I brought you bubbles. I don't have bubbles for you, but I borrowed from uh, the uh, old Wall Street movie, instead of greed is good, green is good. So this is the state's uh, interactive chart on average daily attendance. So the darker green is the best. And what you'll notice if you start here in Stonington and drive west on 95, you have to get all the way to Madison before you hit the first dark green. What that dark green uh, signifies is the state's goal for all, every district is average daily attendance of 95%. So uh, last year, we were in that second band of lighter green. We didn't quite make the dark green. Uh, last year, Stonington Public Schools uh, average daily attendance was 93.2% which was up from 92.6% uh, in 2021. And since the board always enjoys you know, how we are doing regionally, uh, by comparison, East Lyme, Waterford, North Stonington uh, were slightly better uh, than us, where they broke the 94% uh, line last year, while Groton, Ledger, Norwich, New London, Griswold were all 92 percent or below, uh, and a couple of those school districts were significantly below 92 percent average daily attendance. So the other, the flip side to that is you can still have 95 percent daily att average attendance and still have a problem with chronic absenteeism. With chronic absenteeism, the state considers a student, any student who's missed 10% of the school year to be chronically absent. So by the time we get to June, that's about 18 days of absences. But they keep track of it 
right at the beginning of the school year. So right now, any student who's been absent five days since the beginning of the school year is chronically absent. If hopefully by the time we get to the end of the school year, uh, if they keep that under 18, they will no longer be considered that. But chronic absenteeism, and one of the things that, that, that drives uh, all of us a little crazy with this is this state metric of chronic absenteeism are absences for any reason. It includes all of the excused absences that parents give. It includes whether the kid's sick, uh, in COVID, it included some COVID and quarantine numbers. Um, so it is a fact of either the kids in school or he's not, regardless of the reason for chronic absenteeism metrics. So the, this has been a, a nationwide program, uh, not a program, a problem uh, through COVID. Uh, and in the last uh, couple of years here, even in Connecticut, the state rate of chronic absenteeism doubled from 10.4% pre-COVID to 24% last year. Uh, nationally, the average chronic absenteeism for high schools is over 20%, uh, and at the elementary and middle school level, uh, the average nationally is between 12 and 14%. So as a district, Stonington pre-COVID went from 9.2% chronic absenteeism last year to just over 16%. Uh, if you go all the way back to 2015, uh, that Stonington Public Schools was at 8.7 in 2015. Um, so we're going to have Alicia talk for a few minutes about what our high school is doing. Our middle school is also working uh, on uh, some of their own attendance things. But again, like the nation, like the state, the biggest concern for chronic absenteeism is at the high school level. Alicia. So as Tim mentioned, the state average is around 24%. So uh, looking at that number above, which is the number I received this summer, it didn't take this principal uh, too long to dig deep to find out what my problem of practice was this year to work on. Uh, so 27.6% is an alarming number. So we immediately put in strategies, thank you, of tier one supports to start off immediately uh, within the school year. So one of the first things we did uh, was reinstate, um, reinstate um, the letter that we used to send years ago about loss of credit. So essentially what that means is um, if a student is absent for eight times in a class in a quarter, the student loses credit for that class. We had, hadn't used that in years. So what that is, is it's a warning letter that goes home to the families. We bring a student into the office, um, usually during an RTI meeting that I had talked about a few minutes ago, um, go over the letter, speak to the parents to let them know that they are in, you know, there is a fear that they're going to lose credit um, for that class. So from there, we then monitor that student through RTI, meeting with those parents and the student. Uh, one of the first things I did was send a notification out to families um, about the, the chronic absenteeism and the concerns with that and what we can do. And while I would love to take credit for this beautiful letter, um, Jen Bausch um, found this wonderful um, letter called Attendance Matters. Um, and, I th and I'm going to show it to you in just a minute. Um, and I shared that out with families. And it's a fascinating piece of information that informs you based on minutes and days, how much time a child loses in their classroom compared to the grade that they're in. Those uh, letters that I sent out to the families were created uh, into posters, and we're also using them. Um, Tim, could you play my Vanna? Thank you. Take the paper clips off and hold the poster up in front of our audience. <laughs> so this is just a little example of what this looks like. So parents receive this. You can walk around and show families and our board. Thank you. Uh, so, so this was sent out to families um, in Parent Square a couple weeks ago. Um, but just to, just, I'm just going to point out, so I'm not going to read the whole poster to you and bore you to death, but for example, if a student misses one day per week, it's equivalent to finishing in grade 10 when they graduate. If they miss 
three days a week. It's equivalent to finishing fourth grade by the time they graduate. Um, and also, not only is, is it absenteeism, but it's also tardies. So if your child misses 10 minutes per day, it's equivalent to finishing halfway through grade 12. If your child misses one hour a day, it's equivalent to finishing halfway through grade nine. So our guidance department has also created a wonderful um, bulletin board in um, the hallway that also has this information. And we're going to, in about two weeks, Dia, don't say anything just yet to the student body. Uh, we're gonna have a competition and every Monday we're going to announce which grade level has won the best attendance for the week prior. So, um, so go ahead, Steve, you can flip. So that's what the letter looked like, and you can flip to the next slide, that we had sent out to families. Now go back two slides more. Thank you. So um, I'm gonna go back to the sandwich board in just a second. Um, one of the other incentives we did, because our students are fantastic, and a lot of them do come to school every day. So what we decided to do uh, was, uh, we have, we're going to do this in about two weeks, so shh. Uh, we're going to go to every single classroom. We are going to interrupt instruction, and we're going to pull your student out of the class and embarrass them and tell them, congratulations, you've had perfect attendance, or you've been here 99% of the school year, and give them a, a little award from the high school um, to congratulate them on that. Now, what do we do about our students who are losing credit for their class? What we are going to do starting mid-December is on Saturdays, we're going to offer a credit recovery program, whereas our students who are in fear of losing credit for their class can come to school on a Saturday and work with a certified teacher for about two and a half hours um, and to, in order to earn that credit back. So that's another exciting thing we've never done before, so we're excited to start that. Um, and one of, our, one of the things we do need to celebrate is starting in September, um, we compared our rates of absenteeism from day one to uh, the end of October, and we're already down 6%, which is a huge accomplishment. Uh, and just to go back, to do, go to three slides ahead. One, two, three. So the last thing we wanted to do this year, and again, these are all tier one strategies. We haven't hit tier two yet. Yes, we do have a plan for tier two, but we, we're not going there yet, um, is these are examples of a sandwich board that we, that um, Mr. Anderson is going, is in the process of having made for us. The front of the sandwich board is going to be the lovely sign on the left-hand side that says, welcome. We're glad you're here. Every day matters. We love your child. Thank you for bringing them here on time. And then at 731, we're going to flip that sandwich board over and it's going to say, welcome. We're still glad you're here. However, it's after 730 AM. Instruction has begun. Please come to the office. So we just want to encourage our families. We know it's tricky to get our kids here in the morning. I feel your pain. I, I struggle with that too, getting my kids to school. Um, but we want everybody to know how important it is to get their kids here on time, including our kiddos who walk to school and drive to school. So those are just some examples of tier one implementations, interventions that we're doing at the high school. So. Any questions? Before we get to the questions, I just want to add uh, in support of goal number one, uh, we took a look. Uh, typically, our standard is for students uh, who need some kind of academic intervention, uh, the RTI model, we want to make sure that fewer than 20% of our students are receiving some additional interventions. And pretty much across the board, that's true. So academically, we feel pretty solid. We do have some concerns behaviorally, and for the board, that will uh, come up again as we look at staffing going ahead next year with some of the additional uh, mental health and student support services that we funded through ESSER funds. Uh, so uh, behavioral interventions for RTI are up, 
and office discipline referrals across the board at every level are up significantly this year versus last year. At the secondary level, middle and high school, it's about a 54% increase in office discipline referrals from last year. And at the elementary uh, level, uh, it's four times the, the referrals that they had at both elementary schools. Part of that we know is a reporting uh, issue in that we uh, at the middle and high school have been using a discipline tracking program called Educator's Handbook for a number of years. We instituted it uh, at the elementary schools this year, kind of anticipating this uh, based on last year. And so some of that inflation in that number is due to just better tracking and better accounting, but the increase is very, very real. Both schools are reporting uh, a dramatic increase in having to deal with uh, student behavior at the elementary level. Um, so that's the end of our look at student data in support of goal one for tonight. And Alicia and I, now that I'm free of my uh, poster duties, uh, are welcome to uh, answer any questions you may have. All right, I'll go first. Um, as far as the board goes, is there anything that we can do to, you know, financially or policy-wise that um, can help with any of these programs? I know you talked about, you know, we'll be talking about it later on in the year as we get into the budget for next year, but is there anything we can do now and such as, I mean, the only term I can think of is true an officer. Um, do we have something like that already in place? Do we? So, so unfortunately, uh, Mr. Kelly, uh, truancy is a whole separate issue of attendance, uh, where a student, uh, chronically absent students are really kind of our problem and a process problem. Students, students who are considered truant used to be kind of a legal response where we had truant officers in a truancy court that was part of the juvenile court in Waterford. All of that has been dismantled. So the state still counts students who are truant as any student who has four or more unexcused absences in any 30-day period. Uh, and there's a total for the year. Uh, we don't really have a lot of legal recourse with truancy, and so that's why we're trying to work with positive reinforcement and uh, better communication with parents on the chronically absent student population. Uh, I'm sure as we continue, uh, Superintendent Butler and I will be having conversation with the building principals to see what we can do to help this, and as those things arise in the next couple of meetings, I'm sure we'll be back here talking to the board about that. I'm sure you already do, but um, the human services or the, you know, and I'm not looking to, to um, for any child or student to get in trouble, but the police, or police youth officer, um, I'm sure those are resources you probably already use? To a certain extent, yes. Uh, um, and now for the, um, for some of the, is there a, a bus issue or a student drop-off issue as far as kids that I know those that show up at uh, 731 get a little mark and if you get so many of them then they're they're uh, scheduled for detention do I'm some of them show up late and then I'm, I am kind of glad you asked that question so I will I will put it out here so to dismay any rumors um, we did have the uh, Stonington police do a study for an entire week at the light, because that ha definitely has been a source of contention for years. Um, and they did a study, and essentially what it boiled down to was if the pocket of time between 7.10 and 7.20 is the crunch time. So if you are leaving your house and you're at that light between 7.10 and 7.20, you're going to be late. So um, it didn't seem to make a difference if we changed the, the light um, that's what they did that week. They, so they monitored it for a couple of days. They changed the light, let the traffic go, and, and it didn't make a difference. Um, so a lot of parents had emailed me and asked, you know, th there's an issue. So I had contacted the police. The police were on it immediately, and, he, and um, Todd Olson uh, said, we'll administer a study there for a week. They did. 
and I, I communicated with parents who contacted me directly about that and just, just to let them know that yes, we did follow through, um, the police did do a study, but essentially it's unfortunately is leaving the house earlier. That's, it's just a crunch time. We have, unfortunately, as much as we love having Dunkin' Donuts right there, that has been um, a, a big source of contention with traffic. Um, so that's added to it as well. Um, so we have let the, the, the light go a couple of times, but it hasn't seemed to make a difference. So I just want to put, that, put it out there that the police did a wonderful job cooperating and, and did the study for us um, very quickly. So. Now, with the light, I mean, it doesn't always necessarily have to be a light. Do they look at any of the um, turning lanes or kind of, I mean, that's a, obviously a long-term goal. That's to go to the, the state DOT, but I'm, I'm sure if there was better turner lanes out there or a separate entrance, does the entrance towards uh, Davis Standard an option or is that? I think it's not an immediate option. I, like you said, I think that's something with DOT, um, you know, the bus company. We had changed it, um, I think, two years ago, the way the buses enter and leave, um, and it didn't make a difference. But in regards to completely changing, um, oh, but in regards to completely changing, that's a DOT. Yeah, Mr. Kelly, that entrance by Davis Standard has come up in the past. Uh, by design, that's an emergency access road, and so we can't have any traffic on that because, as we all know, an emergency will happen at the most inconvenient time. So if there's incoming traffic on that and there's a fire or some kind of emergency in the back of the building, uh, the first responders need that access road uh, to get back there. Because a parent of a recent uh, high school graduate, me, um, you know, if he didn't leave at a certain time, he'd be late. And then if he was late one more time, he was going to get detention. So instead of getting detention, he chose or would like to have chosen the option of staying home and, and zooming or something like that. So uh, I know that was a, it's a, must be a battle in many households. Mm -hmm. um, if there's anything we as a board can do to help, just let us know. Thanks for the update. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda is the report from uh, the superintendent of schools. Ms. Butler. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to give um, everyone an update on our uh, fruit. Tim and I, we are still uh, at our, our community engagement effort under goal four of the Board of Education to try and use Zoom as a modality to reach more families. We had our third uh, Zoom meeting on the 28th of October. Only five family members were joining us. I have a sense that at least two of those families were new to the, the, uh, the forum, and we will keep on trying to find a soft spot to reach more families. But even if it's five families we haven't reached before, that's, that's a plus. So uh, I'll be working with Farouk to figure out a holiday uh, Zoom for the community. So stay tuned on that date. We'll, find, we'll get that out to the families uh, right after Thanksgiving. Um, I also want to just share with you a calendar um, that Alicia Stripling prepared you. for you. This, I think, is going to be especially helpful as I know the budget season is still kind of new to a lot of the board members. It just outlines um, the calendar and what is going to be happening as we tell the budget story a little bit differently this year. Hmm. Uh, and give you some ideas on you know when you're going to you're going to get your first preview of the SIP this evening. Uh, we'll be looking for you to approve that at the December meeting. Uh, gives you some ideas on when votes are going to be happening. Uh, Alicia is going to present in January at your board meeting, kind of the first iteration of the uh, proposal, the budget, and it will have the contractual obligations and special requests. So it will have the bare bones, what we have to. Um, in, incur with expenses as far as contracts, and that will also include the, the, the newly co um, negotiated contract of the teachers that you know is going to have a big impact on our, our budget request. It will also have our wish list and special requests. Um, at the, the, the following meeting, we will have our, you know, our real, realistic proposal that we want you to consider for a vote for an approval at that time. So it will give you a real insight into the process and the work 
and the time and the thought that goes into this. It will look a little bit different than what you saw last year. I think it will be more helpful to you, and I think it will be much more transparent to our Board of Finance colleagues um, as, we, as we move forward with this process. So I, I wanted to have you see this. You know, it also has the holding place for all the budget discussion meetings. Uh, I sense that, as in past years, with this, with this particular process especially, we won't need all of those meetings because I think it will be, as Lynn Young likes to say, as clear as glass um, what we're asking of you. So, um, so there you go. As we ruin your winter months with more and more meetings, uh, we thought that would be helpful for you to kind of get a sense of how we're going to navigate through this. We will be adding those uh, Board of Finance meetings and public hearing meeting dates as they become uh, firm. So, so thank you, Alicia, for doing that. I think this is another piece of evidence of how the budget process will be a little bit easier to follow this year and uh, less, less uh, abstract. Um, the third item I have for you is an update on the resolution dated October 25th entitled Gender Identity, Gender Expression, and Sexual Orientation. I had th uh, four action items uh, that I needed to uh, follow up on as directed by the board in that, uh, that resolution. I would like to, uh, I, first of all, though, address a public comment that was made this evening about professional development that was not provided to teachers. We had attorney Tom Mooney and attorney um, uh, Sierra uh, come down from Shipman and Goodman and they worked with our administrative team on uh, First Amendment rights specific to teacher situations and classroom situations. We also invited uh, SEA President Michael Freeman to that session so that he could hear exactly what the administrators were hearing. Uh, I have a little bit more time on the resolution timeline to uh, do some of these action items and some other related items. I uh, will be in communication with the Board of Ed about exactly which flag and what that looks like as in the next few days. And um, at that time, then we'll meet with the principals and talk about a thoughtful way to proceed on what will be in the classroom uh, and remain in the classroom and what may have to be removed. I've already had a conversation with Mr. Freeman about that, and we are going to move thoughtfully um, together on this. So um, I just wanted to clear that up because it is a mis it's misinformation, and I'm happy to clear that up for you. Um, under the action items as outlined in the resolution, um, as evidenced by the agenda this evening, the policy committee has met and is making recommendations for updates to several non-discrimination policies and also recommendations for the elimination of policies that will be made redundant uh, upon approval of the new policies. Once these are approved, companion administrative regulations will be posted alongside the new policies. And so for the public and the parents, what the administrative regulations do, it's nothing that the board approves, it's something the administration develops and approves. It is kind of our way of enforcing these particular policies. So they'll include things like uh, directions and forms if complaints need to be made by personnel or by students. And the nice thing about the proposed policies and, the propo and what will follow as administrative regs is they will be very parallel in format and process. They are not that way right now. So I just want to kind of clarify that. Um, the committee will also uh, take a look at cross-reference policies at future meetings and also existing policies specific to political displays or influence in classroom settings that may be need, in need of assessment and they may need to be revised or they may meet, just be fine as, as they particularly exist right now. And I just want to remind the public that one of the major functions, the primary functions of the Board of Ed is to develop and approve policy. So, they're doing that work now. On Wednesday, uh, November 9th, they met with the union leadership from the following bargaining units, the Secretary's Union, the Paraeducators Union, the Custodians Union, and the Administrators Union. The leadership from the Teachers Union, or the SEA, and the Nurses Bargaining Unit were unavailable to meet. The, the units that I did meet with will begin, no, uh, the paras, the nurses, and the custodians, and the secretary will all be entering into negotiations um, at, starting at, during the next school year, at the end of the next school year, with the administrator's contract in the following year. 
that the current contract for the nurses and paraeducators already have um, non-discrimination language in them specific to gender identification. So the meeting we had was just to discuss possible model la language for the other bargaining units to consider as we move forward in the bargaining process. We also offered model language that was developed by attorney Grello, the, one of the board's attorneys. We also offered the option if any of these bargaining units want to enter into a memorandum of agreement to include model language around that gender identification and non-discrimination in the interim that they may do that. The SEA has taken advantage of that. Uh, Farouk signed the MOA tonight and Mr. Freeman will sign it most likely tomorrow morning. Um, so it was a very positive, uh, positive meeting. I did also follow up with the president of the union, of the nurses union by phone. Again, it's a rather moot point for her because the language is in their contract, but I wanted her to have all the documents that the other union leaders had um, and let her know the process and, and offer, to, you know, to entertain any questions as we move forward. Um, the resolution has been distributed to families. Uh, I believe that also happened via fam uh, Parent Square on the 28th of October. Uh, the staff has also been notified at the same time. High school students were notified uh, yesterday of it. It's posted on all district and school websites. Translated versions are also found there as well as was asked um, uh, through the resolution. Each school has the resolution posted in the main office, staff rooms, and uh, where appropriate on school-wide community or DEI bulletin boards. Stonington Middle School will use the advisory period next Monday to share a condensed and kind of age-appropriate version of the contents of the resolution and let the, the students know where they can find the full version online. They will also have hard copies available if students are interested. The same message and, uh, will be shared with the families of middle school children so that they are, are familiar with what their children are going to hear during um, those advisory periods. So that's where we are with that. And as always, uh, students counselors remain available to discuss topics uh, contained in the resolution. The high school uh, teachers were reminded uh, to uh, be sensitive to this during advisory periods and to reach out to students uh, after the last board meeting. Uh, as uh, Dia mentioned, uh, Tim Smith, Michael Freeman, and I met with the student government representatives, I think in early November, um, just to kind of, discuss with them and share with them how the situation unfolded, share with them the resolution, Attorney um, Mooney's memorandum, and answer any questions. I will have meetings with each grade level of the student government in the future as I traditionally do anyways, and if they have any questions, they're welcome to either contact me through DIA or reach out to me directly or Tim directly. Um, and we also have offered to, to meet with the Alliance for All, uh, acceptance for all groups if they so choose, um, as they will probably be impacted by this, this decision. Um, so that's, any questions on where we stand with the resolution? We're pretty much on track, I think, under our timeline as, as uh, directed by you folks. Okay. I do have an update, as I have promised in my, uh, my entry plan, to kind of let you know where we are with our district improvement plan. Um, Tim and Alicia, thank you for kind of covering all the, uh, the facets of goal one, which covers our academic status right now. Um, and I'm going to pick up with where we are um, just on students who, as related to that goal one, students that are actually re receiving supplemental services that we call response to intervention. We are pretty much right on target, which is very strange if you look at our attendance and our discipline data. Um, we are really kind of right in that RTI pyramid with three out of our four schools. Um, about around 20% of the kids are receiving either tier two or tier three interventions. West Pine Street School is a little bit higher, but not significantly higher. So there's a little bit of a disconnect between what we're seeing in discipline and what we're seeing in academic performance. So one is a little out of whack, one is right on track. Uh, so what, as, we, as, I, as I tell you a little bit about our student engagement work, we're gonna be very curious to see what that data tells us. Are we on track or is that where we need to uh, beef up our game to control that behavior by becoming more engaging in, in the classroom? So stay tuned for that. Um, we have actually begun the, the classroom visits to capture both student engagement data as well as uh, curriculum implementation data using the, uh, the ESCON tool. 
Um, I visited Stonington Middle School classrooms this week with Jen McCurdy. Uh, Tim has been out uh, and we have additional administrators going out tomorrow to visit classrooms. Most of our leadership uh, team members will be engaged in the next couple of weeks in this work and then we will be uh, looking at um, that data at our one of our December leadership meetings and, and making some decisions about what that tells us. Does it mean that we need to do more professional development around this work, around the trauma sensitive practices, or do we need to do some gentle reminders and some feedbacks at specific grade levels or specific schools? So that's where we are um, with student engagement under goal two with DEI and SEL. Uh, social emotional wellness, the SABRE screening instrument will be administered during December in grades 4 through 12 as part of a state mandate to administer a social emotional screener. Parents may opt their student out of this assessment, um, uh, but this is a nice self-assessment for us. Um, the teachers administer it. It's nothing that this, the, the students actually take. It is actually a, an instrument that teachers fill out on the students. Um, and we, we have a YouTube video that explains it by one of the developers of the instrument that the parents can view again if they have any questions about what that entails and what we're actually measuring. Um, it's the same instrument that we used at the secondary level last year, um, and we're very lucky to have one of the, the experts around that instrument as a parent um, and local resident, um, as she has a West Vine Street School student. Under DEI diversity, equity, and inclusion work, our DEI corners continue to be featured in the newsletters, and the ABAR team puts together, has put together a calendar of events for families that publishes the various ways that um, nationally recognized DEI months will, are happening in our schools. One of the features that is getting positive feedback is our, our district readers at the elementary school level. They've been warmly received and widely viewed by the school community. Um, it's, uh, this month's celebrity reader is our very own Alicia Stripling. Uh, our, our new business and director of finance and uh, personnel is of Cherokee ancestry and she has read and recorded We Are Grateful by Tracy Storrell in celebration of American Indian Alaskan Native Heritage Month. Um, so look forward to seeing that uh, posted on our DEI website and it's going to also be linked in the elementary school newsletters. I also was forwarded an email from a West Vine Street school teacher today from the assistant principal that she expressed what a nice feature that is to see staff members that don't necessarily work in her school and learn a little bit more about the diversity that exists among our staff. So I thought that was very welcome and positive. As far as board presentations, we um, hope to have West Pine Street uh, Elementary School <clears throat> students will be sharing their African drumming skills at an upcoming meeting. They weren't quite ready this month, so we'll see if they're ready next month to perform for you. We also will have an update on the Witness Stone project from our eighth grade social studies students, probably in, uh, in the, the, winter, um, the winter months. Um, and the curriculum submitted for review by teaching and learning is evaluated for diversity in text programming and student choice and voice. As far as the, the district improvement plan goal around CT SEDS, I'm sorry Allison's not here tonight. She had a family situation take her away, to take her away. We have a goal around having all of the IEPs and 504s um, ma managed in this new system that has quite frankly been a complete disaster uh, in its rollout. And so I just wanted you to know that we're plodding along. We've actually, Allison and I have reached out uh, to the CSDE to express our um, frustration with the, the lack of the, the professional support that's been given um, in rolling this out, but uh, Allison and as her more and more of her time is being uh, consumed by uh, troubleshooting and professional development because this was not piloted correctly. So we'll get there, we're using the platform, but I just want you to know that it is not smooth sailing in that particular goal right now. For professional outreach around DEI, um, we have shared at several uh, workshops and meeting, meetings, uh, starting at the National Harbor at the ASCD Leadership Summit. Uh, Alicia and I presented our work around that um, at a national conference. I shared the work at the Embassy of fin Finland in Washington, D.C., and again, this upcoming weekend, we'll be sharing it at the CABE conference. So you should be very proud that Stonington is getting the word out about the word that we're, work that we're doing around increasing student engagement by the use of trauma sensitive practices. 
Also, our Future Focus Schools initiative um, that was featured today at Teaching and Learning will be part of uh, a presentation at the National School Boards Association Conference programming this April. So we're doing a lot of work. We're getting a lot of good PR out there on our DEI work. Mm -hmm. As far as family engagements, you've heard from our welcoming schools teams. Uh, Tim and I did not have the right link, Alicia Daw, I'm sorry. We missed it today. We, we had it on our calendar as a Google Meet, and it must have been a Teams meeting, and so we need to do a better job at participating there. So apologies to the high school team. But we have um, ha had some really great meetings at the other three buildings in person and working around links to learning and partnering and having great conversations with parents. They've been very positive experiences. Uh, as far as safety, uh, we've had staff, staff in all five buildings have had two training sessions alongside of the uh, Stoning to Police Department. The department has debriefed the district and building leaders on professional development uh, opportunities that they have uh, implemented on all practice drills and on the unfortunate swatting event that has recently been experienced by our schools. Our youth officers and other officers randomly check the schools and provide uh, feedback to the district and the schools on any uh, areas of improvement that they see. The Stonington Police Department and Stonington Public Schools continue to collaborate to improve safety for students and staff. Uh, the town is preparing a job description for our school security officers, and we're looking for ways that we can partner on funding for that this year and then in the future. Um, I also uh, want to thank the school office, youth officer. She continues to not only to provide instruction in the DARE programming for our elementary school students, but she also partners in providing other safety instruction at all levels. Um, as far as communication, we now have a stipend positions uh, to address uh, and to support our updating our websites uh, because that was one of the areas of, that we identified as a need of improvement by our welcoming schools committees. Um, and we are looking for a universal area. That, we know that's a universal area of improvement for us. And, uh, and it's, it's made some strides already in keeping those websites fresh and updated so that it provides meaningful information for our families. And then finally, under community engagement, there is a laundry list of things that we are proud to say that we are doing to create a sense of oneness in the community. Um, we have standing uh, meetings with the police chief and the first select woman, and it's been enormously helpful, not only in planning for our, the three budgets, uh, but also partnering um, among agencies and functioning as a true town. And it, little things, uh, you know, the chief asked me to take a look at an invitation he was preparing for a promotion ceremony, and, you know, just reaching out to help each other as true team members. It's been a really, um, it's, a, it's an evolving relationship between the three agencies, but it's moving in a very, very positive direction. Mm -hmm. I also participate in town department meetings on a, a monthly basis, that is something that Danielle, our, our first select woman, has started. We also have monthly, I have monthly meetings with our uh, town board liaison who's in the audience tonight. That's been super helpful to me. It's been have an informal way to have conversations that have resulted into um, other meetings that have been kind of exciting, uh, might not sound exciting to you, that we've had meetings with the Solid Waste Department. We're looking at um, piloting a composting project with the town with one of our schools to get a gauge on whether or not that could be a cost neutral or maybe even a cost savings uh, process, a way of eliminating waste in our schools. Um, pretty exciting to kind of, again, be partnering with things. Como has been awesome. They're helping us with a STEM day for our Stonington Middle School f folks. And uh, we're also in initial conversations with how their makerspace can help provide SPS Stonington swag with our new logo on it, which is nice because our children are, are actually participating in that after school program and they'll be developing our Stonington swag for purchase and distribution as part of our welcoming schools work. Uh, monthly meetings we have with our state legislators who are enormously ho helpful in strategizing legislation that um, is, can be helpful to us in addressing our policy needs, as well as taking feedback on what is not working for our schools. Uh, Ocean City Chamber, I, I encourage you to look forward up to upcoming information on how our students uh, are partnering with the Starry Light event that is happening in Pawkatuck and Westerly very, very soon, and you'll be able to see a lot of our student art displayed um, from all levels of our school students. Professional development partnerships exist with NESS. Uh, we also are looking at a future co-teaching project that will be coming, more information will be coming on to, the, to you on that very shortly. It's a very future-focused practice. 
We're also working, we continue to work with Griswold Public Schools um, on the future focus schools projects. We're in the early stages of beginning in-person conversations with staff next week on a volunteer basis so that they can learn more about how they might um, be engaged in that work. I'd like to, take, to thank Mr. Smith who made a short video to remind uh, the staff of what the message was at our convocation and kind of invite them uh, to, to participate in these shop talks around future focus practices. Electric Boat is collaborating with our elementary school STEM teacher to introduce manufacturing careers to our students at those grade levels. Our HBI partnership for our high school students um, is persisting and at the national level, again, I'm partnering with the lead there to promote this program across the state. And then finally, I'm planning some podcasts uh, to share uh, our, the Child and Family Counseling Center work that's happening right here in this building until they're ready to move into their permanent home at, in the Pocketuck um, shopping center across the street here. And then also um, probably do some another podcast either on our future focused work or our um, work partnering with NEST. So there's a lot going on that's just kind of a, an overview of where we are with our district improvement plan and all of the goals that you folks set and to keep that work at the center of our, our focus and our conversations. So if you have any questions, it's a lot and there's more, but I just wanted to give you a, a snapshot of where we are. The board members have the advantage of getting week by week updates on this, but for the public, um, it's also important for you to know all of the work that is underway. And I will entertain any questions if there are any. More of a comment than a question. Um, you know, you listened to Tim and uh, Alicia and some of the challenges we are having with the chronic absenteeism and some of the scores and where, where we're going with that. And, you know, that was like a little bit of the lower side of the spectrum, I guess, or the, um, and then presenting everything that you presented tonight has the other side of the spectrum and just shows that you know, what our district is doing and can do. And I just think that whatever else that we can do to obviously support your efforts and, and doing all this stuff, we as a board, I'm sure, um, would, would be 100% 100, 100 behind that. It's a, it's a great challenge. I, you didn't have your water bottle there tonight to <laughs> take a sip. I almost brought you mine. But um, it's just, you know, I was sitting up here earlier and I was just like, man, you know, what are we going to do about this and what are we going to do about that? And I know, you know, you guys are on it, mm -hmm. but, you know, what is our role as a board to support that and do that? Um, and then, obviously, we're going to be coming into uh, budget season and we're going to have the, the tough, tough decisions to make as far as the budget goes. But um, the second half of your report or the, the, the after, you know, was was reaffirming that we're up here for a reason and you guys are doing what you're doing for a reason and and you know if we can just get you know I sit up here wondering what can we do to get these families engaged what can we do to get these students engaged and it's like you know we can't teach them if they don't show up obviously you know and you know I was thinking of uh, one of our special uh, staff members at the middle school that you know I think on Friday she she, she runs out to sift and if the, if the students show up for like five days in a row, she'll, she'll promise them. It's their, the carrot at the end of the stick. She'll promise them a, a nice cookie from SIF. I'm like, can I get one? She's like, no, Dan, wait till Christmas. Um, but it's those things. And that's money out of her pocket, you know. So whether, you know, financially speaking, you know, we know teachers do a, take a lot out of their pockets and do that. But I know we do have this Stonington Education Fund, and we do have the PTOs. Um, so just thank you. You're welcome. And I just want to remind everybody that, you know, it's our first year getting back to really being in the classrooms and, and, and collecting data. And so we will have that leverage to adjust practices and move resources around based on what we're seeing on need. So, but the best thing you can do is, is to be thankful to your teaching staff and your, and your, your whole staff. I think that's the, the we appreciate them more than, every, and than anything. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Superintendent. Um, next item on our agenda is consent agenda. Uh, vote is required for this item. Uh, so if anybody would like to move any of those 
Uh, items of the consent agenda, if not, I'm asking for a motion. So moved. No, unmoved. Second. No, no, I no she wants to move. I, 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 I had oh, yeah, one that I was asking about, which is was in the no vote. Can we talk about that? Policies for first read, no vote required. Oh, okay. So there is a motion on the floor from, by Mr. Kelly. Is there a second? Second. There is a second. All those in favor of approving the consent agenda, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. Thank you. Um, next item on our agenda is the subcommittee reports. We'll start with Mr. Agnello from Teaching and Learning. Thank you. Uh, if you'll remember our last meeting uh, last month, um, I reported that we didn't have any curricula that subcommittee meeting last month to approve, which is why you see um, no curricula to approve today. Um, but at today's committee meeting, we did do, uh, I have two things to report. Um, first, we got a, a brief presentation on the Future Focus Schools Initiative, which Superintendent Butler mentioned a couple times in her update. Um, my explanation of it won't do it justice, um, but it's essentially professional development teams that are inclusive of multiple levels of educators and administrators within the district uh, with the goal of moving the district's education into the future. So I think it, it does a really good job of taking advantage of the expertise and creativity of the professionals that we have in our district um, uh, to, to drive some ideas on how to move our district's education forward. Um, also today, we reviewed one curriculum uh, the Family Consumer Science Child Development course. Uh, and as part of an extremely real, applicable, and robust curricula, it has to be one of the most hands-on courses that we offer, and that students in this course must spend a minimum of 48 hours with, quote, the world's most advanced infant simulator, uh, which is a super fancy computerized baby doll. Uh, the Teaching and Learning Committee experienced one of these dolls firsthand during our meeting today, and you'll all have that curriculum available to you for first read at our board meeting next month. Um, so it was a, a eventful committee meeting today. Um, that's all for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Agnello. Mr. Donahue? Yeah, so we got an update from Peter on uh, the boilers that got fixed. Uh, so while, while we're waiting parts, uh, those boilers are, are safe and ready to go right now. Uh, we got an overall estimate on replacing all the boilers in the future um, around, and that came around 800 grand, or 800,000 rather, sorry. Um, and then uh, after that, we talked about the ESSER fund update, which we got from Alicia, which we're going to work on in the upcoming budget. Uh, we're finding out what we're doing with positions that are currently funded by ESSER funds and how to mitigate once we lose the, uh, the ESSER fund money, uh, once that goes away in 2024. And then we have a report on the SIP funds, which um, Peter and Chris are going to go over with us tonight. So that's all we had in the subcommittee meeting for tonight. Thank you, Mr. Donahue. Mr. Kelly? Uh, we have a uh, second read, or a first read for several of the policies that are listed on the agenda. Um, we, the policy committee met on November 3rd, and we'll continue to meet to get through all these policies. And did you have a question on one of them, Heidi? I did, but do I ask but now? Sure. Okay. So... Okay, um, so this was on the no vote um, agenda. It was 5145.P, I don't, what does, why is P in front of it? Just policy? Okay, 5145.5A, and in my question was about the place that qualifies for Title IX conduct concern. And it's in the second paragraph. It said, uh, for conduct to violate Title IX, the conduct must have occurred in an education program or activity of the board. And um, I, I remember a couple of years ago that a hostile environment occurred because um, there, I felt there, well, we knew there was sexual harassment occurred with a, was a sharing of intimate photos um, that were just supposed to be between two, but then it ended up all over social media. It was, it was shared in confidence, and then it ended up all over social media. 
and it caused a very hostile environment of learning. My point being, do we, can we add something there about, I, I don't know if you put cyber bullying or cyber harassment. I know in the, in the bylaws concerning bullying, um, they talk about cyber bullying as, as being acknowledged as, as the possibility of the, a transgression of one of the bylaws. But it, it's very specific here that the conduct has to occur in an education program activity of the board. What if it is outside that and could be in um, in on the on the internet? Can you give us the policy yeah. number then? It's okay. five one four five dash uh, dot point five. Point five. Okay. It's a first read, so it, may I suggest that we take all your notes and send them to the committee okay. so they can revise the as based. It's a lot of notes there. I will also tell you, Heidi, that that's a, that's a Shipman and Goodwin model policy, and it's a mandated policy. So when we change wording, we have to go back to the lawyers and spend money. So let us do our, let us do, we can take a look at the cyberbullying policy. There's other policies that, that may address may, your concern. May cover it, yes. Correct. But the only place I could find the cyberbullying was in the, um, the transgender, and it wasn't, it didn't seem like it applied to transgender and, whatever, uh, transgender and gender nonconforming youth. It, okay, it so if you send us your question, like specific questions, because I th I think that whole point of the interference in the like in the in the educational programming, even if it happens outside of the school, I think your concern is it happens outside of the school day. Right, but it but it I mean, but it, it then it happening inside the school. It day doesn't too. matter because if it's if if it's there's a spillover to affect the learning environment, which which is what typically happens. Right. that triggers it. That triggers it. Right, and so it's covered. And what covers that? Which bylaw covers that? The one you're talking about is going to cover that because it's, it's the same language as it's going to happen. It's going to spill over during the school day. Yeah. And there's one, what, what you're looking at is that there's parallel policies, one for personnel and one for students. Yeah, I'm looking at yep. students. Yep, yep. Yeah, I was looking at students. Um, and then the final question I had was um, on this, Second page, uh, P5145.5B, it says that the administration shall also, this is not working, the administration shall also periodically provide training to all board employees on the topic of sex discrimination and sexual harassment under Title IX and Connecticut law, and so on, um, but not limited to in reports of sex discrimination. Have we had this training, and perhaps I missed it? Yes, we have, and we have had um, staff trained probably more than um, is required, um, both uh, at the administrative level and then at the, um, at the staff level. Okay, so it's not the board. No, it's, it it's us. When they say the, the, the policy language, when you hear the board, it can be often confusing, because by the board they really mean me, directing the, the, the staff, okay. making, sh making sure that it's happening. And you'll see that language over and over again, and I know that bothers you, I think, sometimes when you feel like it's your personal, you know, it's the board's as the entity's responsibility. Right. It really is, is kind of legal ease to, to refer to the administration. Thank you. But if you could um, get your notes and questions on the 5145.5, um, we can, it's just, it's a first read and it'll come back to the board right. and, but, um, but it doesn't sound that anything could be done. Well, no, to it. Yeah. something we'll, can always be done. We'll check. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And we'll be meeting again shortly and we'll bring it back to the, um, as a policy committee, we'll be meeting and then we can, um, bring it back to the full board for its, the second read. So, um, do you need a motion for the? I know, well, you don't need a, one for I for no vote required. And then um, tonight we have a second read of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven um, policies that 
we had the first read on last month and we need a vote on that. I will move that uh, move that uh, motion. Motion, yeah, motion to approve uh, policies uh, in, in under uh, uh, policy subcommittee C2. There's, there's a motion, there's a second. Just a comment that um, we did the first read of this last month, and if people go online and pull up the agenda, there's hyperlinks for all these policies um, that you could read, and then they will all be hyperlinked on the uh, website once these policies are approved tonight. Any other discussion on the motion? All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Anyone against? Any abstention? Motion passes. And then under uh, part three of this uh, policy subcommittee, there are four policies that um, are to be admitted upon their second read, which is uh, the ones that are listed here. And those are either superseded by um, new policies and updated. Some of the policies were a few years old, so we have new ones. Some were not mandated by the state and um, the policy committee decided to, uh, we didn't need more than we needed. Um, and then we do have uh, further clarification on some policies from, uh, was it Shipman and Goodman? So that's, there's various reasons why there's four policies that are um, gonna be emitted upon the second read, which will be next month. Um, so that's the report from the policy committee. Thank you, any questions for Mr. Kelly? Thank you, Mr. Kelly. Uh, next item on our agenda is the SIP review, and I'll turn it over to Peter. You, who's, who's taking Let's the lead? Let's start with Peter. Okay, so historically the SIP uh, has been presented on, in November with the opportunity to review it and come back to December's meeting for approval. I would like to highlight a couple things. If you open up your first page to the large spreadsheet, which looks like this here. I Peter, wanna, could, excuse me. Can yes. You, um, for those that are watching at home or those in the audience, and the, again, this is um, one of our full first time going through a lot of this. I mean, last year we did this, and you know, it was our first meeting, and it's like, here's the SIP report, prove it. And they're like, what? Could you do a little... Uh, introduction of it like you know what it is and oh, sure, sure, what the sure. process is etc yeah please so see. so the capital improvement process is uh, these are projects that are in excess of ten thousand dollars which the Board of Education deems necessary and important to uh, complete the SIP process is then uh, we, we review the SIP process in-house goes to the Board of Education for approval after we uh, review it such as we're doing today then goes to the town for their approval, a cuts adjustments are made from there, and then it's voted on as part of the budget. Um, heading back to the Excel spreadsheet, I, I, I'd like you to take a look. The, the most important things that we're gonna review today are the yellow column, which is superintendent proposed CIP 2023 to 2024. This is what we're proposing tonight. The column to the left was last year's adopted CIP. One thing I'd like to have you guys take note of is that you'll see in, in the uh, really bright yellow column several zeros and, one, and a one. The zeros which line up with previous projects means that those projects have been completed. We do include it in this year's SIP as uh, part of a, a um, showing that the projects have gotten done, so we're zeroing the line item out. So you'll see that in your narratives. Are there any questions so far? A dollar placement, um, such as a district school furniture replacement, is a, is a placeholder. That means that we're in the process and we'd like to start the process. We wanna get a placeholder for it. And then if you look out to the right of it, you'll see two years later, the money starts to roll in for the request for that furniture. The first six items 
I, I, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Number seven, you'll see that there's nothing there. That's PCB air monitoring for the elementary schools. The town has historically paid for that. We include that in the CIP as a reminder that they're covering that cost. This is part of the PCBs that were discovered at both West Vine and Dean's Mill. We had to do testing for three years and we are now currently in the process of petitioning the DEEP so that we can stop because we've passed every single test that we've done. I'm going to turn the mic over to Christopher Willison, the Director of Technology, and he's going to review the first six items as they directly relate to him. Thank you, Peter. I'm going to do an overview of each item. I'll pause after each. If you guys have any questions, just let me know. Um, as you'll see with each of the project request forms, when you turn after the um, color copied Excel sheet there, you'll see the request forms. Um, that includes the itemized breakdown that we're doing over the next 10 years. And following each of those will be quotes and backups for those as well. So the first project we have for the Department of Technology um, is the security system and cameras. Uh, just uh, as a reminder, we received funding for this building, which we're in the process of upgrading security cameras here. And we'll be adding uh, additional cameras throughout the district where needed. Um, so this request for $40,000 is to begin building a fund to support the eventual refresh. So a couple of these projects I'll talk about today are building a fund towards a refresh for projects we've implemented recently. Gotcha. Any questions about that? You may note the, uh, one of the quotes in here does have redacted information. Uh, that's just camera models uh, and company names for security purposes. The next project is the phone system. Again, we recently upgraded that last year. Uh, so this is building that fund uh, to the tune of $13,000 per year over the next seven years in preparation for that refresh as well. Any questions on that? Next, we have our Chromebook one-to-one uh, -one initiative. Uh, again, we are a one-to-one -one district at the middle and high school for Chromebooks. Uh, and then we have classroom uh, issued Chromebooks throughout the elementary schools. Um, the goal here is keeping as close to level funding as possible. You'll notice a trend here where we're trying to keep a flat uh, budget for the Board of Finance. Um, so again, we've got $127,000 requested. Coming up, this includes the Chromebooks, the administrative licenses to manage said Chromebooks, as well as the GoGuardian licenses, which is what we use to provide uh, both filtering on these devices while students have them at home, as well as uh, interactivity with the teachers in the classroom. Um, so that includes those licenses as well. Any questions on the Chromebook initiative? Yep, Mr. Kelly. Only because I had a first-hand experience with it. Um, I know the GoGuardian. So what is the... Um, Price for a GoGuardian uh, subscription per per is it four hundred? We have four hundred seventy-five that we pay six dollars and twenty-five cents each for. Correct, um, and we actually multiply that by two. This is half of that district licensing. So rather than bake in all of one school or the others, since we use this across the middle and high school um, and some of the higher grade levels at the elementary, what I do is I sort of spread that out over that SIP request each year. So you'll see two lines on that quote from Trefera. You'll see one line for administrators and one for teachers. Administrators is the filtering component to make sure we're SIPA compliant. And the administrator, um, the teacher's portion is that interactivity uh, component that the teachers use in the classroom. The, so we have 475 subscriptions to GoGuardian? Is that what uh, that's saying or? We have, this is uh, just under half of the refresh. So it's a little, little over double that. So my concern is uh, about 13 months ago, I was a para, and paras were told that we couldn't afford, the district could not afford additional Go Guardian uh, subscriptions because of the expense. And, and so it's like $12.50 or? Is that, I, it's just, it was a valuable tool that um, both during COVID and 
post-COVID, uh, the Go Guardian, which is, I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with it, it's a, a means for the staff to, I don't know, maybe you can explain it better than I can. Yeah, from the teacher perspective, just a high-level overview of what Go Guardian does. It lets the teachers see all of the student screens. They can take control of those devices. They can redirect students to a specific website. Uh, if little Timmy is uh, getting distracted and on a YouTube, perhaps, they can redirect. Uh, and then they can also lock all their screens and print a message, something like eyes up, to redirect focus in the classroom. So my concern at the time was, or some of the parents' concerns was that there was not enough Go Guardian subscriptions, and the so parents did not have um, access to them. Is that still the case? Do we know? And if so, is that something that we can? Is that still a tool that they would want to use? I can't imagine them not, because you know, there's one teacher with 20 kids, and that teacher is in front of the classroom or in front of the monitor teaching the class, and the kids are following along. But you know, like you said, little Timmy, I don't want to stick a particular kid out. Um, but little Timmy's off on YouTube world, and the para is there, whether it's a classroom para with one or two students or more, is there as well, and, you know, is kind of can't redirect Timmy because they don't have access to GoGuardian. Yeah, so two, two answers to that question. One is we do currently have uh, additional Chromebooks now assigned to the paras, so this licensing, while yes, you can use it alone, typically you need a Chromebook assigned with it. So the cost was both a Chromebook paired with the management license of a said Chromebook, as well as the uh, GoGuardian license. So the, the cost expands upwards from there. We could, if, if we had it set up this way, allow them to bring a personal device in, but we don't use district-issued software on personal devices. So even if we purchased you know, the tune of $13 here for this license, we don't have the means to provide them a district issued device to install that software on. So that's where the, the contention came. I can say, however, at the middle school, um, most of the paras have access, if not all. The high school, we do have a dedicated rack now as well where paras can check out Chromebooks. It depends on their assignment that day. Uh, we don't just issue uh, 100 Chromebooks to all 100 paras in the district um, because many don't need them for day to day. Uh, so we have made those available in the last year. I will double check with the building administrators to make sure they know. Any other questions on the Chromebook initiative? Okay, moving along, the next project um, is our computer systems infrastructure project. Uh, this is a large project that essentially supports um, the backbone of the district. So this is uh, everything from our uh, cabling infrastructure, our core switching and routing, um, all the way out to wireless access points, et cetera. Uh, so this year, uh, in our proposal, you'll see a few different quotes in here. Um, the first one, this Wally quote here, is for the refresh uh, of um, the core networking equipment as well as wireless access points uh, for Dean's Mill School. Again, we're doing these on a staggered refresh um, going into year four, uh, and with the 11-month lead time, uh, on these devices, we'll be replacing them at their end of life, expected end of life. Uh, so that Wally quote you see there, the WCA, um, that is for uh, the switching and wireless access point equipment. And then the next three quotes you'll see after that from DEF Services Group, uh, these are to purchase outright our um, fiber optic lease. So currently, we lease our fiber optic connections between our schools back to the high school. Um, so this is not an improvement. Uh, what this does is allow us to own said fiber optic cable uh, rather than lease it. Um, it's about uh, twelve dollars to $13,000 a year per lease um, that we pay. Uh, so it only takes a few years, as we can do the math out, uh, to pay for itself. So this is a cost-saving measure that we're looking to implement. Uh, this was proposed to the Board of Finance last year, um, but again, due to budget restrictions, was cut uh, because it's not mission critical. It's just a cost savings over time. All of the fiber optic cable we purchase uh, has a 30-year rating uh, at the minimum, so that's a full warranty. So we get a lot of use out of that and um, a, a large cost savings as well. Are there any other questions on that? So you're not running a new fiber optic. You're buying what you have in the ground. 
No, we would purchase our own fiber optic cable and perform an aerial installation for the poles. Got it. Yep. Which would save us a bunch over time, what you're saying. Yeah, each school is a slightly different lease amount, um, but it averages out to that 12000 So if you kind of do the math out, you're looking at about eight years until you start saving that money. Mm -hmm. But again, it's a 30-year warranted cable. Um, we would easily get 35, 40 plus years. One concern the Board of Finance had expressed last year when I presented this was, is the technology going to become obsolete? Because a 30-year cable is great until, you know, like Apple changing their, their ports, it's no good. And I could assure you that this technology, uh, fiber optic, will surpass that 30-year mark and carry speeds much, much greater than the district uh, will likely ever need. Any other questions on that project? Yes. The, the quotes are two years old. Is that something that we're comfortable with? Yeah, and these were uh, estimates provided. So these are higher quotes. So I did not increase these. Um, the fiber optic cabling has not gone up tremendously. Uh, labor has gone up a little bit. Um, but fortunately for this specific project, uh, it's not compute technology. It's giant spools of cable. Um, and then it's really labor and permits and fees we're paying for. So not a huge increase. This would go to bid, uh, as would all of these projects. Um, but this goes through USAC because it's E-rate eligible. Uh, so we are an E-rate uh, funded district. So we would get a 50% discount on all of these. So when you add up these quotes, it's obviously much greater than the amount I'm asking for. That's taking into account that 50% discount. Okay. That's a good, I was gonna bring that, I was gonna bring that up, Dan, that's a good question, because uh, we, we've notoriously, when we go in this early, uh, the quotes never seem to hold if we ask for a hard quote. So if we've gotten a quote from the years past, we'll add up an estimated amount for inflation and, and cost of livings and everything else that goes along with it. There are a couple quotes in here that are absolute, and I've gotten, well, I'll talk about that when I get to a couple of mine, but for the most part, again, they're, they're going to be, they're going to go to bid, and they give us a, a pretty good idea of a ballpark of where we should be asking for our CIP money. Any other questions on that project? Okay, moving on, we have the Staff Computers Project. Uh, again, we are one-to-one uh, -one with Mac Ayers um, for our teaching faculty. Uh, so this is, again, level funding. Uh, we requested $50,000 last year. We're requesting an additional $60,000 this year uh, to perform the first half of the district refresh. Um, and then over the next two years, we would keep adding to that and finish out that refresh uh, one school at a time. So this originally, we did the entire district in one shot. We got 0% financing terms through Apple. So this way, we're trying to spread out and stagger that refresh, trying to get to that school by school uh, modality. So the code is 108. Are you, are you using the 50 and the 60? Is that the math? Correct. Thank yep. You. So we, we received the 50 last year. It's sitting in the account for this project. This would be the 110 to make it up. When we refresh, what do we do with the expiring MacBooks? Do they go off to MacBook Heaven, or do they? Um, we I'm hope just... they go to MacBook Heaven. Mm -hmm. No, they, they, we ended up uh, trading them in to help offset some of the cost. Um, so we have a, a responsible green recycling company um, who does uh, help us provide vendor credit for those uh, older devices. Is an older expired MacBook better than a older expired Chromebook? I'm just. Yes. Is that something that we could uh, so. see if the, no, see if the pairs were interested in using those? Because I know the, the, the Chromebooks have limitations to them that the MacBooks do. And whenever, as if I converted into substitute teacher mode, I was had access to a Chromebook. And I'm like, whoa, this is so much better <laughs> than nothing. Yeah, I'll, I'll say this with the, the Mac Airs, um, after that five year mark and the daily use that they get, they do start degrading. Uh, the OS updates that Apple is pushing out, um, the, the full revs on an annual basis at this point, are quickly making the older versions obsolete. And while you as a consumer don't necessarily have to keep up with that, from a security practice, we do. Um, so you quickly see degradation when you're nearing that five-year mark. Um, so while you know the consumer side, 
may say, yes, you can stretch and get eight years out of this laptop. Um, that's likely because they're staying ver versions or revs behind on some of those updates, which tend to slow down the device and uh, render it obsolete. Same with the Chromebooks. After five years, Google stops releasing security patches for them altogether. So we don't, we don't keep those around for, for obvious reasons. I notice it's, uh, it starts decreasing in uh, 2026. What's, why, why does the, the ask for it start, stop dec start decreasing? So over the 10-year projection, we're hoping, and mm -hmm. this, is, this is a guess, right? We're, we're going out this far. Um, right now, we're facing a large cost associated with the adapters. So Apple has once again changed the ports on these devices, rendering all of our existing mini display port adapters obsolete. So now we have to purchase uh, to the tune of around $16,000 in new adapters. We're hoping that they stay on this protocol so that as we move down the road, we can start reducing that mm -hmm. and reuse adapters and then purchase those in, in smaller quantities. Got it. Any other questions on these staff laptops? Okay. Uh, moving on, we have the audio video systems. Um, so this is a, a hybrid approach here. We're in part uh, beginning to build a fund um, for the eventual replacement of uh, projectors district-wide as well as the interactive flat panels or smart boards we have at the elementary schools. Um, tough to think, but we're already going into year four with these boards. Uh, so we're, we're starting to plan ahead towards that. Um, this also includes funding. You'll see the quote package included uh, for the projector uh, for both the commons and the auditorium at the high school, both of which are in desperate need of, of replacement. Um, the, the auditorium projector has already died. We've got a, a makeshift uh, rolling cart and two by fours and a projector propped up for now. So we're hoping to get uh, funding to get that accomplished as well. Any questions on the AV project? Where are the um, smart boards on these? Uh, the smart boards are, the quote's not included on these. Um, we're actually in the middle of looking at some alternative options and uh, hoping to save on costs for those. Um, but those, uh, the building project cost was just about $500,000 for those boards. Well, that was for both new schools? Correct. Any other questions on the AV before we move on to Peter? All right, thank you. Thank you. My items aren't as fun. Um, I'm gonna, we're gonna go past the PCB air monitoring for elementary students, go to the kitchen equipment. I'm gonna go through the ones, I'm gonna go through each one just to explain exactly what's going on right now. And the, the kitchen equipment upgrade that we got last year uh, has been completed. We're uh, expecting delivery on all three dishwashers to be installed over Christmas break. So there's uh, replacements for Dean's Mill, West Vine, and the 20-year-old Hobart machine at Stonington Middle School. We'll have all brand new dishwashers. Any questions on that? Excitement abounds. I'm sure they're all excited. They are very excited, mm -hmm. yes. Um, the upgrade at the BMS and, and Stonington Middle School, uh, the BMS, so let me, for those that don't know what a BMS is, a BMS is the building management system. That's what, if you see me during the meeting and I have my laptop open here because we're in night mode, I'm monitoring the system and playing around with it so that we can stay comfortable. Otherwise, it gets down to about 60 degrees in this room. So the building management system needed a desperate upgrading in both Stonington um, Middle School and District Office. I have it now have it, they've both been completed. We are completely done with all the schools, we're upgraded. I have all four, or uh, all five buildings on my computer right now and I can control the heat from anywhere. That is complete. Maintenance truck, this is a, a new one that we've put in. Yes, I'm sorry. There's no sheet. Yeah. Yeah, it's all done. Zero. Maintenance, uh, the, the replaced maintenance trucks. We have, we have had a fleet of maintenance trucks which are uh, extremely old. They're, 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 they're costing us more than they're worth to keep on the road. So we need to replace two of these trucks right now. Now, I have a bid in the back here, and you'll see it's for $45,500. Uh, I've put in for 102 because of the um, the volatility of the of the auto market is not dependable, so we're trying to make sure that we have enough money to buy the two that we need. 
Right now, uh, just last week, we broke one of the trucks. And when I mean broke, it's, it's broken in half. The frame is gone, the axle is gone, and we've gone down to uh, what we had a fleet of four trucks for plowing. We have two right now. That's two, two trucks for plowing going into the winter season. So we're, we're in, in need, we're gonna do the best we can to get it covered with us in the town working side by side together, but we are in desperate need of, of uh, some new uh, work trucks. Peter, yes. what, what are the ages of those trucks, what year? So the one that just broke was a 2008, that was the newest one that we had. Um, we, I'm sorry, that was the newest one of the old ones. Mm -hmm. The other one that went to the scrapyard this summer was 2000, and the one that we still have on the road is a 1999 GMC. So you'll be, if you get the new trucks, you'll be able to maintain them for a long period of time? Yes, yeah, so we we have a maintenance program that will stretch them out. The trucks should be, there was a plan to get the, a rollover of every five years of getting a new truck. That never occurred. And what ended up happening is now we're having a, a, a large number of vehicles bought at one time. So we can keep the trucks anywhere but if, with proper maintenance 10 to 15 years. On the um, sheet, the project cost, cost, you're 102 for this year, but then you're not looking for anything to, until 30, 31. Right, we have, a, we have another truck right now, it's a 2017. And we were able to, and we had our other truck that we put, purchased on CIP a, a 14 months ago came in. So we have two trucks right now that are operable. One's a 2022 and another one's a 2017. What we just broke was a 2008 and the 1999, the 2000 truck went to the scrapyard. That was the one that just came in replaced. Do we, or does the Board of Finance, would they prefer that we put 10,000 every year so, for five years to get to the 51 or do we? We, we certainly can split that out and, and go that route, yes. If you, as a savings account. Right. District uh, number 12, district school furniture replacement. If you see, I've got a $1 mark there at this point. We're in good shape, but we're, we need to start uh, putting a savings account aside so I wanted to get a placeholder there. Nothing next year, the year after 10,000, the year after that, nothing, the year after that, 10,000, and so on, so that we can start uh, rolling out some of the uh, furniture that's gone by the wayside at the schools. We're, we're okay now, and we've used up most of the furniture that we've uh, taken as a result of the consolidation of the two schools. So we're in, we're in pretty good shape, but I just want to have that be a, a placeholder so that we can start the conversations. You, you missed the, the custodial, custodial equipment. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, number 11. <laughs> um, those are uh, stripper machines. Uh, the stripper machines are handheld uh, smaller units, which they can go into the hallways and corners so that we can clean up and do uh, waxing in between the seasons where we don't have to normally strip all that down, all the wax on the VCT, which is the vinyl, uh, vinyl tile, we can go in and highlight it. It, it. it cuts down man hours tremendously because normally when we do any stripping, it's a chemical action. We have to go through three, usually three, four processes to get the, the wax off. Then we go through, it's a whole cleaning process, and then we have to apply three coats on with these strippers. They're great for the mid-year cleanup, and you can simply go over one area quickly and throw a coat of wax on it and the floor just comes right back. It, it really is a man hour saver. We've had a couple of them and it's, now it's time to get one for each school. So if you had a couple of them and now you're getting four. No, there's, uh, there's yes. We have, we have two, uh, one for, well, there's five buildings where the, wherever the vinyl floors are. We have a small one here for the upstairs where we have vinyl flooring. There's, uh, we currently have one at the high school, which is a larger one, and we'd like to get three more for Dean's Mill, West Fine, and Stonington Mill School. But the code is for four. Oh, that's a doodle bug. Um, that's, a, uh, that's, that's, a, that's the cornering unit. That's what goes into the corners. Oh.
the district school furniture replacement? Okay, uh, just one other yeah. question. Yes. Um, I should bite my tongue, but I'm not. Um, have we ever looked at contracting out for the waxing and the stripping of the floors? Is that like a labor intensive? That would be a violation of the union. Well, that's why I said that's why I bite my tongue. The the minivans for special ed replacement uh, last year we we were, we have a we purchased a van uh, we have a zero line item and then if you look we carry it out in the next few years to replace the remaining vans those are our vans that we have parked out here that are used for special ed. Any questions on that? The high school uh, rooftop unit rebuild in Gym AC. We've finished all the rebuilding of the rooftops. We've rebuilt 14 of those. That's all done. Um, we've zeroed that out as a placeholder, and we're, we're, we're complete at the high school at this point. The high school generator upgrade. Uh, is is in process this year. They've they've given. Did you want to go back to the? We, did you just fly over gym upgrade? Or did you, we didn't get there. Yet. We're not there. Where are we? We're on, on number fifteen. Upgrade. Fifteen. I have vans for special education, and then I have high school gym upgrade. High school rooftop unit rebuild in gym AC. He's, he's reviewing. Yeah, he's reviewing just, items. He's not asking money for. He's, he's going to tell you the generator's done. It's good news. You shouldn't have anything there. Sorry. <laughs> I know. Sorry. Spoiler alert. So the high school generator upgrade is for the new panels that are going to be installed at the school. That was given to us last year. That's in process right now so that we can properly distri distribute power um, in the high school without having to worry about freezing the building if we ever have a catastrophic power failure in an ice storm. Uh, at this point, the buildings, uh, at this point, the buildings, boilers will run, the circulator pumps will run, but the air handlers won't. So we want to make sure that we can run some of the air handlers around the building, and it's, and it's, it's going to be a, a more efficient uh, distribution of power. The high school gym upgrade, number 16. Last year we were given $35,000 to do the gym floor, which is complete. Uh, if, I, if you haven't seen the gym floor, I really encourage you to see it. It came out amazing. The proposal for this year is $21,500, and that's for the, uh, we're going from what's called a roll-up canvas divider to an accordion canvas, or an accordion divider to separate out. This is where we would separate the sections between the auxiliary gym in the main gym during basketball games. And there's also another divider that you may not ever see if you go to an event there, which divides the main gym in half. These, um, these dividers have seen their day. They're ripped. They're torn. Um, they need to be replaced. The next year out is for 20350 and that's to replace all the pads at either end zone of the uh, basketball court. Those are torn. Um, some are falling off. I mean, it, it, it just it, it's it's gone through its life cycle. Any questions on that? Yes. <clears throat> are these generic pads that you're putting up, like the solid color blue ones or whatever? Yeah, the canvas colored foam pads. Yep. Is there any need or desire to put up some colorful ones or some uh, ones with uh, the Stonington Bear Den logos on it or anything like that? That maybe uh, if it was an added cost that uh, um, boosters could uh, that, that, some. Yeah, that Brian Marone's going to make the call on that. <laughs> tell, tell him it's a, there's a suggestion. Okay. <laughs> Number 17, the library flooring and repair. Last year they gave us a placeholder of a dollar for that. This year we're asking for 39750 to replace the carpet in the library. Um, if you have been in that library now, the carpet was original, was part of the building project, so it's, we're at 18 years of life on that carpet. The carpet was a rolled out carpet, which is a large sheet product. What ends up happening over time is as we clean it and wash it and scrub it, those products end up shrinking. My, my suggestion is to go to a tile-based project, 
and we can then, as things wear out, and we can replace individual tiles as opposed to entire sections of carpet. The current carpet at the library has several large rips and tears in it. Right now it's being covered up with duct tape, and it's, it, it's just time to go. The carpet has gone past its usable life by eight years. Any questions on the carpet? Number 18, the high school roof repair and replacement. Part of that project is, is uh, we're in the early stages of that right now for repair. The roof has taken a fair share of foot traffic on it as a result of the rooftop units that were in constant repair over the years. So those sections of the roof have delaminated specifically above the commons area. That's being addressed this year. The other parts of this is part of a savings account to replace the flat sections of the roof. As you can tell, the, the roof from the road, you can see stainless steel. That's a generational roof, 50 plus years. But we do have still flat roofs in the back, above the gym, above the commons area, and above the uh, admin area, where we have two different types of roof. We have an EPDM sheet product on some sections of the roof, and we have a bit mod, which is an asphalt rolled granular covered roof. Both of those are coming to the end of life very shortly, so we need to get a savings account to start re uh, replacing those. So the 250 is savings, not? That's uh, savings, okay. yeah. Middle school AC upgrade. That is, uh, we currently have $500,000 in that account, requesting $10,500,000 for a total of $11,000,000 to do a complete upgrade for the entire HVAC system, which includes all new rooftops, 11 new, new, 11 new units, ductwork, wiring, compressors, roof structure reinforcement, and well, I think that pretty much covers it. It's, uh, the only thing we're basically keeping are the boilers. The rooftop units have come to end of life. The it, was, it was suggested, and I agree that there was no sense trying to modify a 24-year-old rooftop unit. It's better to replace it. Um, so this is where we stand at that project at this point right now. Are there any questions on that? And that's not a fixed cost, right? That's an that's a engineering estimate at, at the completion of the engineering project. So that's within a 10% margin. So no, there, it's not an exact figure. We would have to go for a professional estimator separate from the engineer to get a hard, fast figure. The important thing to know is that that figure would be accurate for today only, and they would give you probably a six-month uh, guarantee on the price. After that, it's going to change. And, and what would that cost? An, en an engineering study? I don't have the hard figure. My guess is that we're going to be between eight and $15,000 to get a, an estimate. Any other questions on that? Middle school science room upgrade has been completed. That gets zeroed out. That's $10,000 that was purchased for science tables. That, if you recall, that was as a result of us moving classrooms around that were not normally ready for science, and now they are. And finally, the last one, number 21. If you recall, we had a, a parking lot um, water issue at Stonington Middle School in the side parking lot. There was an underground water uh, intrusion, which was basically an underground stream that would percolate up in during the winter. It caused a tremendous amount of trouble with the parking lot, specifically for freezing and, um, and safety. We solved that water problem, but as a result of that, the entire parking lot has crumbled. So we've been, we've been patchworking it with coatings and sealants and that it's it's beyond it's it, it needs to be completely ground up removed and resurfaced with new, new asphalt that this price that i have for one hundred and thirty one thousand seven hundred dollars includes the entire side parking lot the dumpster pad that's crumbled the back lot and the emergency access points around the building from the side lot around back to the other side of the building that also includes the line striping as well. The next year, if you see, I've added uh, monies to save up for the next 
four, five years, to, that would be used to complete the front lot. The front lot never had the water damage as a result of the underground stream, so that lot can, we can, we can make that lot stretch out another five years. I can just add testimony to the side lot where, I don't know how many people got hurt over there. I mean seriously hurt because um, when the water was leaking in the parking lot and it iced over, I, I don't know, it had broken bones or ankles or something like that. It was um, on more than one staff member. Um, does any of this include the parking uh, enlargement? The back, the back parking lot, I asked them to stripe out for parking for the, uh, for the, the cafeteria staff. So it would add, actually at this point, that one, that job right off the bat would add 10, 10 parking spots. The front lot, the front lot we have to, we'll have to address that one when the time comes for it. Was that part of the, um, any of the upgrades from previously that, that we asked for a larger park? Or I guess it was during the, yeah, the we consolidation never, it was we, brought up. We never upgraded the, the parking over there. I know you didn't. But wasn't that brought up during the consolidation of the middle schools? Yes. And, um, that got kicked to the curb mm -hmm. or never funded or what have you? It didn't get funded. Are there studies that, um, or was there a study done at the time that showed what we would need to, I mean, is there already like, preliminary plans of what would be done? So for the front staff lot, you'd have to get a, an engineered study to see the staff level at this point. We're at 100% capacity. Uh, there's 100 parking spots and there's 100 staff members there. I know, and, and often they park on the grass. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and God forbid uh, you have a presentation in the auditorium or the gym of a basketball game or a play um, or on uh, back to school nights or whatever, it just, you know, it, it makes for a challenge. So, um, if going forward with this, I'd like to see something more than just a resurface. And if there could, I know it would obviously add additional cost, but um, there's a need to expand that parking lot if possible. Okay. Also, uh, before yes. our next meeting, I'd like to get an aerial, uh, kind of like a Google, like, and just show us. Show what's exact, going to be done. Sure. What's going to be done, yep. and just shoot it out to all of. To, so, so there's, there's still a drainage issue there? It's still, no. it's no, gone. No, we fixed that. No, we fixed that. It, that's already been fixed. It's just been, got damaged from it was there from, being so yeah, much. It was, Tim, 20 years? Yeah. So 20 years of water percolating up through the asphalt. Got it. The hydrostatic yeah. pressure was unbelievable. It was, just for uh, an added comment, was, I forgot who it was. I think she might be the current vice principal there that she parked her car in that side lot and she got out and then the car started sliding and instead of getting the heck out of the way, she tried to stop it from sliding. I'm like, get away from that car. It's like, you're not gonna be stopping the car. So um, yeah, it's definitely it was an issue and thankfully it's resolved. Any questions on the capital improvement plan? So take, take it home, study it, uh, ask questions and questions to Marianne, please. And uh, hopefully this process helps better, you know, like clarity and uh, hopefully you'll be, uh, have all your questions answered before our next meeting where you uh, need to um, approve it so we can present it to the Board of Finance. Question? Again, the process, it was so new to us last year. Yes, sir. Um, do we, um, next month, do modifications to it if, if board members so desire, um, such as subtracting or deleting or anything that would? Correct. So. Correct. And so then um, will it be like a historical presentation maybe of uh, what we've presented to the BOF before and you know, maybe over the five years and, and uh, you know, I mean. We can send you the last, uh, so column that, the one that uh, Peter was trying to cover was the last approved SIP. Uh, so that gives you one year. And if you're asking, we can send you uh, the last f four other years, you mean? Something like that, just, I mean, sure. last year we, 
Well, what do we, re maybe what, what do we request? You know, did we request three million last year or five million last year and they gave us 1.5? Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's right there. Isn't that? No, that's just the, what was approved, the 1.5 million. Oh, got, um, it, got it. Yeah, but, that, that's what was adopted. Yeah. yeah. That wasn't what was asked for. So we can, we can probably pull for the record for the last uh, four years, if you don't mind, and, and we'll send you a total of five, right? That's the ask? If that's, I mean, I've never sure. done this before. Maybe Alicia would have, you know, you know, the second time going through this, and if we've gotten any uh, feedback or direction from the Board of Finance of uh, what they're, I know we don't like it when they give us direction like that of what they're looking for, but. Yeah, I, our job is to present what the needs are for right. the schools and the kids, and their job to tell us we don't have the money. Yeah. So I, I would, I would like always, and, and this is on, you know, uh, you know, I always like to present the need, the actual need, and we need to tell them what is needed from our perspective because we understand the schools and we understand the needs for the kids and the staff. And um, it's their duty to say, we do, um, you know, their fiduciary duty is responsible for the money cash, right? So let them tell us they don't have the money. Uh, other questions on SIP? Next item on our agenda is the monthly reports. Any questions on the monthly reports? All right. Um, Next item, uh, we have two, two more items, comments, and then we're going to go in an executive session. So comments from uh, board members. I'm all set. I, I have a comment. Yes, ma'am. Um, we've hit a year mark of working together as a board, which is kind of washing over me right now. Um, so I wanted to take this moment uh, to provide an opportunity as I'm gathered with my fellow board members, um, but also the community at large, to personally affirm my commitment to the duties of the board, to our bylaws, to the scope of our mission. Um, I think it's important for me to be able to, to share that with you all, that um, I take my duty and my role very seriously. And as we hit this one year mark, wanting to be able to publicly affirm that and, and commit that to, to you all to operate within the bounds of our bylaws. And that I look forward to our board moving into year two and the work that we will continue to be collectively doing together. So thank you, Chairman, for your leadership over the last year, um, leading four of us to this place that we are right now. And I, I look forward to how I can continue to learn and grow and do better through your leadership. Any other comments? Kevin? All right. Um, the uh, ID? No. All right. I ask a motion to move into uh, an executive closed session to discuss personal matters discussing regarding health related extended leave requests. And I ask to include in that motion the invitation to our superintendent of schools, Alicia, and Tim as well. Just make the party bigger. So moved. Second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. That was unanimous. We're back. Mr. Kelly. The motion to go into the executive session, you have the motion to now is a board meeting. Mm -hmm. I have a motion to uh, suspend the agenda and add the resolution approving, the board approving the extended um, medical leave for two staff. So moved. Second. All in favor of suspending the agenda to add an item to approve the extended leave? Aye. Aye. All right, motion passes. So now I'll make a motion to approve the Board of 
that approves the extended family leave for two staff. There's a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That, that was unanimous. Thank you, Craig. Thanks, Craig. Um, all right. So uh, motion passes. Next item on our agenda is the adjournment. Motion to adjourn the meeting. Motion to adjourn. Second. second. All those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 That was unanimous. <laughs> <laughs>